Let's learn about this brave lady who had horrible taste in men and overcame some pretty crazy stuff in her life on this episode of Antique Bottle Stories. In the field of cosmetics, you may have heard of Helena Rubinstein, Elizabeth Arden, or C.J. Walker. Though Rubinstein, Arden, and Walker seem like business pioneers, they were not the first American women to build a beauty empire. In the book, Dispensing Beauty in New York and Beyond, The Triumphs and Tragedies of Harriet Hubbard Ayer, the author tells a fascinating story of a little-known Chicago socialite who overcame many obstacles on her way to be the first American woman to build a successful cosmetics empire and then becoming an influential journalist, writing and eventually editing the women's pages of Joseph Pulitzer's New York World. Harriet's story is of a woman who thought she married well when she married Herbert Copeland Ayer on October 2, 1866, at the age of 17. Mr. Ayer was 31. They had plenty of money, and they would travel to Europe, and she could shop as much as she wanted, she became a mother to two daughters, but while the children were still young, Harriet realized that her husband was a drunk and often ran around with other women instead of coming home. Divorce at that time was not a popular idea, so Harriet's first step out of her miserable marriage was in 1882 when she moved her and her daughters, Hattie and Margaret, from Chicago to New York City. She started working at an antique furniture store, Cipher & Company, where she had been a well-regarded customer. Eventually, she became a buyer for the company, making trips to Europe, and that's when she met a French chemist, Monsieur Miralt, who ran a pharmacy in Paris, specializing in perfumes and creams. His grandfather's famous formula was well known in France because it supposedly helped a French socialite, Juliette Ricamier, maintain her beauty. Harriet eventually persuaded Meralt to sell her that formula. Then she needed to find American suppliers of the ingredients and develop a version of the cream that could be manufactured in the U.S. She did, and by 1886 she started the Harriet Hubbard Ayer Company at 25 Union Square, New York. She changes addresses a few times. Here's another address at East 34th Street. I don't know if you can see it, but it says Harriet Hubbard on the building. Harriet proved to be a skilled marketer of her products, and of course, her best seller was the Recamier cream. Her products included creams, balms, scents, brushes, soaps, and more, which brought in over $1 million a year. She used much of her earnings for interesting advertisements, and paid endorsements by famous entertainers, like Lily Langtree. Her advertising genius led to her commercial success. So here's where things start getting hairy. She started divorce proceedings against her husband. Then she got involved with a General E. Burb Grubb, who left her for a younger woman. Then she met a swindler named James Seymour. Seymour hired her for furnishings for his yacht and she obtained a loan from him, and with his money she launched Madame Ricamier Toilet Preparations Incorporated at her kitchen table. This was actually before she made it big. So with her business being very successful, she had repaid the loan. Meanwhile, Seymour orchestrated the theft of Harriet's business. When she tried to fight back through the legal system, Seymour was contriving a way to separate her from her daughters, who were in school in Europe. Between 1887 and 1893, at the height of her career as the head of her cosmetics company, Blanche Howard, a finishing school mistress in Germany, turned Ayer's daughters, who were enrolled there, against her. Ayer was publicly accused of scandalous behavior in five lawsuits in 1889, which were broadcast weekly in the newspapers. In her attempt to regain control over her children, she was drugged and isolated, some sources say kidnapped, and eventually institutionalized in 1893 
by her former husband, encouraged by James Seymour, who was working to take over her business. Eventually, Seymour arranged to have Harriet committed to an insane asylum. Ayer's mental symptoms, a combination of melancholia and an addiction to the doctor-prescribed morphine for headaches, exhaustion, and insomnia, led her to being committed as a lunatic. It took 14 months for her to escape from the Bronxville Insane Asylum. She had help from some family and friends. When Harriet finally gets out of the Insane Asylum, her business was lost. It had been run into the ground and was sold at a receiver's sale. The buyer was an employee of the company. When Harriet took her to court, the lady stopped conducting business under the Harriet Hubbard name. More about that later. While recovering from her ordeal and to regain the respect of her daughters and the community, Ayer gave dramatic lectures in 1895 documenting the intolerable conditions in asylums. Her career as a journalist started a year later, when in 1896 she was hired by the New York World to write and edit their new weekly women's section. She was highly regarded as the author of articles about beauty, health, and etiquette for Joseph Pulitzer's New York World. Her essays were compiled into a popular book in 1899 and was reissued in 1974 and more recently in abbreviated format in 2005. Her articles and advice columns usually preached common sense regarding diet, exercise, and skin care. Among the societal changes she pushed for was that of more practical clothing for women, a concept that was not acceptable at the time. Her campaign became known as the Rainy Daisies, as it came from a group of women who called themselves the Rainy Day Club. They advocated for lighter weight clothing, less constricting corsets, and shorter, less cumbersome skirts, like above the ankle but below the knee, which was like, <gasps> at the time, because you weren't supposed to show your ankles. Wouldn't their heads be spinning if they saw what people were wearing today? <laughs> Harriet realized that wearing skirts that dragged in the, quote, filth of elevated railway stations and from the mud and dirt of the city streets, unquote, was inadvisable. Harriet wrote, for 12 years of my business life, I have sat for hours each rainy day with damp, often soaking skirts about my ankles, and have suffered in health in consequence. Thousands of other women have done the same in this city alone. She identified with the working women and directed her columns to them. Even though she was a pro-feminist, Ayer never joined the suffrage movement. She protested that she was not really a dress reformer. She counseled women to go ahead and wear corsets, and she advised that older women should use cosmetics to disguise their age, kind of starting America's fixation with youth as the epitome of beauty. She cautioned against tan skin and vigorous exercise for women, which might produce well-developed muscles. The beautiful arm, she wrote, should be round, white, and plump, and should taper gently to the hand with an adorable curve at the small, delicate wrist. Ayer consistently advocated that beauty was a woman's greatest power. She argued that wives needed to pay attention to their looks to keep their husbands, and for working women to advance in their jobs. This was her attitude towards the power of beauty. In 1902, she publishes Harriet Hubbard Ayer's Book of Health and Beauty. During the last seven years of her life, she was the highest paid newspaper woman in the United States and was receiving 20,000 letters a year. In 1903, Ayer died of pneumonia and nephritis at the age of 54 in New York. I don't know if her daughters ever reconciled their relationship. I don't see Harriet ever getting married again either. So I wonder if she had any family around her when she passed. After her death, her daughter Margaret apparently had the company's rights and sold her mother's name to a Vincent Benjamin Thomas. He continued the Harriet Hubbard Ayer Company as president and treasurer, and Margaret was the secretary. Thomas died about 10 years later, and Vincent's wife took over the business. Records do not show Margaret being involved with the business anymore, 
But interestingly, she started writing beauty articles in the New York World newspaper, like her mother did. She ended up marrying an editor from the newspaper. The Harriet Hubbard Air Company ended up being sold to Lever Brothers in 1947 for $5.5 million. It changed hands a few times, and then it got absorbed by a London-based company. They still sell the product, but not under the Air name. My bottle is a square milk glass, but I'm not sure which cream it would have had in it. And this bottle probably dates before 1920. And that's it! Hope you enjoyed this story. See you next time. Thanks for watching.